Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Karina Robinson, co-director of the Inclusion Initiative with my colleague, Professor Grace Lorden from the London School of Economics. Now this new research center at the LSE brings together behavioral science and data to create inclusive cultures, inclusive corporates, inclusive, dare I say it, law firms in the city of London, Wall Street, across Asia, wherever we're currently practicing. We're currently working on fantastic projects which range from how artificial intelligence can promote inclusion in the workplace to how luck versus effort is attributed across different groups. Now do follow us on Twitter, which would be at LSE underscore TII or sign up to our newsletter. And that detail will be put up uh, in the chat box right now. The event is recorded and after 40 minutes, I would like to ask Georgia some questions from our audience. So please put them in the chat box. This is the 10th of our Open Door, Open City monthly webinars. The name really speaks for itself. We aim to open the door to professional and financial services, to those from all backgrounds, all talent should be incorporated and should be heard. And that's how you create a culture of innovation, of productivity, of openness. Now we are immensely lucky to have with us today, Georgia Dawson on your screen dressed in red, the first female senior partner of a magic circle law firm. And can I just say, on the back, maybe it's not on the back, but almost on the back of her being elected, Linklaters then made the same move and it has a female senior partner now. Now, Magic Circle Law Firm, for those who are not familiar with the term, means the best, most profitable law firms in the world based or headquartered in the UK. George has been head of Freshfields' Asia practice and she's a lawyer specializing in internal and regulatory investigations across jurisdictions. She's practiced in Sydney, Hong Kong, Singapore, and London, quite a geographical spread there. And she's a recognized LBGT plus ally. A big welcome, Georgia, to Open Door, Open. Thank you, Karina, for the warm welcome and, and the invitation to join you today. Let's start, Georgia, with, with quite a big question. Now, Freshfields, most people, including your competitors, would say it's ahead in terms of its diversity and its inclusive culture. But being ahead of your peers doesn't necessarily mean you're anywhere near where society and societal expectations are. What have you been doing right and what do you think needs more work to create a more inclusive culture? Thank you, Karina. So it's a, a good question. I think the firm has been focused on its culture and trying to create a diverse and inclusive workplace for a period of time. And in that period of time, we've made some good progress, but I think we all acknowledge within the firm that we're not where we would like to be, which I think fits in with your point around where we stand, not necessarily as against our peers, but as against society more generally. Um, so it continues to be uh, high on the agenda and certainly top of the agenda for me. Um, what have we done right? I think for a long period of time, we've had global programs looking at different aspects of diversity and inclusion and providing colleagues with um, career tools to help them to advance and navigate through a, a large organisation um, like ours. Um, and I think many organisations have done, have done the same thing. And that's provided, I think, some incremental progress. I'm not sure it's accelerated progress, but I think it's certainly provided support and guidance and um, provided a degree of confidence. I think we've then moved on to conversations around um, bias and unconscious bias and making sure that people have a good understanding of that and that that is front of mind when we're taking key decisions within the organisation. So by way of example, we, we recently went through our internal process to evaluate candidates for partnership before we started the evaluation and the interview process, we had someone come in and run a session for us on um, unconscious bias so that before we looked at the papers, before we started debating it, we, were, we had that front of mind and, and could check ourselves or at least challenge ourselves as to whether or not we were taking decisions um, with as little bias as, as is humanly possible. Um, I think we're now moving to, so that there's been quite a lot of focus on um, raising awareness and I think helping people navigate within the existing structures. 
I think what we now need to do as an organisation is look at those structures and say, are they working? Should the organisation itself change to make us a more inclusive workplace? So that is um, the language we use within the organisation, the things that we value within the organisation, the career paths that we offer within the organisation. Are they working to support our DNI objectives or not? Um, so uh, they're, they're some of the things that we have done um, as an organisation. A baseline in terms of culture, two years ago, we ran a, a process across um, the firm um, talking about our culture and refreshing it and re-articulating it so that it was accessible to all of our colleagues. And um, that then resulted in what's called the Being Freshfields Principles. And that provides us with a framework within the firm for how we should be interacting as, as colleagues um, a way for us to constructively challenge each other if people are falling short of those standards. And I think that just helps to reinforce on a global basis, recognizing it's a large and complex organization, but on a global basis, what are our shared um, standards in terms of how we want to operate and the culture that we want to have as a firm. If, um, if we focus on gender, just for one moment, you um, announced in March, March, so a couple of months ago, your global gender diversity target, new partners should average at least 40% women, 40% men, 20% could be men, women, or non-binary. Now, this year, so the same year you announced the targets, you're already at 50% for women. I mean, bravo, okay, bravo. I bet you you're one of the few, um, I haven't actually looked at the numbers, but I'd be willing to stake um, a good lunch on the fact that you're probably the only Magic Circle law firm that's managed to have 50% of your newly, um, or newly appointed partners be women. What are you doing right there? Um, so uh, let me take that in, in a couple of uh, parts. I'll talk to the targets first. Um, going back to what I was saying before, we, we are pleased with the progress that we've made, but we recognise that we needed to do more. And um, I felt when coming in as senior partner that one of the things that would really help us make um, positive and accelerated progress was to set ourselves some targets so that across the whole organisation, people were very focused on um, making sure we delivered on those targets, but also that there was accountability for me and the wider management team to, to deliver on those targets so that within the organisation, we came out very clearly and said, this is what we're going to do. So there's um, a lot of people watching me now to make sure that I deliver. And equally, there was some, some external coverage um, as well. And I do think that that focus on diversity and inclusion at the most senior levels of an organisation is one of the things amongst a range of others, but is one of the things that will really help organisations drive that change because um, you have role modelling that is required. You have people who are looking at this as a topic of relevance on every key decision um, and making sure that those decisions are reinforcing the objective of delivering a more diverse and inclusive workplace. For our most recent partner class, yes, we're, we're really, I mean, it's a fantastic group of um, colleagues and a great group of um, skill sets amongst them with uh, covering areas of the law that are going to be relevant for clients going into the future, tech, life sciences, and a range of other more traditional areas of the law. Um, that partner class was developed over a period of years. So going back to my last answer, all of those things that we had been doing for a long period of time helped to shape that partner class and the prior management team shaped that partner class. So our targets came effectively after that partner class had been formed. So we didn't have the 50% outcome simply as a result of the target. It was a, you know, developing a partner class is a two to three year exercise. Um, that said, um, we are pleased that we have exceeded the 40% um, objective. And the challenge for all of us in management and me in particular is to make sure that year in, year out, we are as focused on this topic as we have been to date. It was interesting, one of the things you've said is about how making sure that that everything you look at, every decision is taken with diversity and inclusion um, and things like your targets in mind. Because what tends to happen in some firms that fall behind, one has a feeling that they look at it once a year and then they're surprised that they won't be able to get there. I think, I think you're right. I think um, like any 
key aspect of your strategy. I think it needs constant attention um, and making sure that we have a really and, and genuine, uh, genuinely um, inclusive workplace that is attractive to diverse candidates, um, where diverse candidates can belong, where diverse candidates can thrive, excel, be promoted, um, is a strategic priority for the firm. So it needs constant attention. Interestingly, the SRA, um, and I was talking with a partner about this just recently, um, the Solicitor's Regulatory Authority, in, I don't know if it's every committee level or every, uh, just their key committees, they have a process of uh, doing a diversity and inclusion impact assessment on the key decisions that, um, that they're taking, which I think is a, we don't do it in necessarily exactly the same kind of structured way where before a proposal is put before the board, it has to have that type of impact assessment as part of the papers that go to the board. But it's clearly for the SRA an important discipline and I think reinforces the importance of this um, for those who are making the, the decisions. It's something that people need to turn their mind to. Yeah, absolutely. And the PRA is doing more and more on that too. Um, on Wall Street, the city, we appear to have gone backwards when it comes to racial diversity in the last decade or so. Yet last year, we reached a seminal moment of consciousness hopefully a tipping point on the back of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter. You know, corporates started putting targets in place, quite hard targets, um, which they had never sort of done before. They've given management time to it. It's more accountable. I mean, do you feel we've reached a tipping point on racial diversity? I really hope so, Karina. I think um, obviously the, the proof will be in the next couple of years in making sure that this also remains front of mind for those in, um, in senior leadership roles and, and those with key decision-making power. Um, but I, I'm very hopeful that uh, it is a tipping point. Part of our global targets that we set um, back in March, one element of that looks at um, ethnicity and as a global organisation, uh, we need to frame that in slightly different ways in different parts of the firm to reflect the situation on the ground and, and where we need to be making an effort for our workplace to more accurately reflect the communities in which we work. Um, that said, in, in London and, and the US, a focus on our um, Black associate population and Black uh, partner cohort is really important. And within our uh, targets and the commitments, which are the key actions that we're going to take, there's a real focus on, on that. Um, and so for us, in those targets and commitments, um, ethnicity will be a key focus over the next five years. You've had all sorts of awards for being an ally in LGBT plus, and I'm, I'm going to mention one because we don't have time for all the others. Stonewall Global Senior Go out on the for society is moving Karina, I think I lost your connection there, but I think you were asking me about um, the LGBT plus advocacy and and why I'm fo why I focused on this over the last several years. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, so in in my family, growing up as a child, uh, I have a close family member who is part of the LGBT plus community, and um, we also have a number of close family friends um, who are as well. And some of those people are in um, you know, long-term relationships that are longer standing than my parents. My parents have been married for over 50 years. Um, or I've observed them go through different moments in their lives where I've observed the, um, the injustice that they might experience. So um, those that have been together for longer than my parents, the inability necessarily to get married, um, questions around property rights in the context of a long-term relationship, um, but quite emotionally, I think things around um, whether or not you can be the next of kin um, in and when you have a long term relationship with somebody. So those types of issues, I think, were uh, things that I was familiar with, felt were manifestly unfair and wanted to try and make a difference where I could. And the firm that I have worked at both in Australia and, and then when I joined Freshfields have always had a really strong pro bono um, uh, program and so through my pro bono work I've been able to work on 
a range of different cases in a range of different jurisdictions trying to advance equality um, and LGBT plus rights. So we've had some great successes in the courts in uh, some jurisdictions in Asia. Um, uh, we've got some cases that relate to uh, refugee applicants who are fleeing their home countries as a result of persecution because of their being a member of the LGBT plus community. Um, and so being able to play a role in that sphere um, is really meaningful for me, as well as in the workplace once I became a, before I became a partner, but I able to influence more once I was a partner and certainly once I became Asia managing partner, now senior partner within the organisation to be doing what I could to ensure that our uh, health insurance programs were equal access, equal coverage for our LGBT colleagues, um, LGBT plus colleagues, um, looking at um, the language that we used in different policies to make sure that it was suitably inclusive around um, relationship status, for example. So some smaller things, some larger things in terms of just having the discussion within the organisation to try and create a more inclusive workplace. Some people might think what I'm about to ask is a bit of a joke, but it isn't really, which is that you are Australian and you're the first senior partner of a Magic Circle law firm that has an Australian at its head. And diversity comes in many forms. Um, one of the things that's been a bit worrying post-Brexit for the City of London is the world of amazing talent that comes to the UK. The government seems to be rather obsessed with uh, tech, but tech, you know, there are a lot of, perhaps one could call them old fashioned professions like the law that are hugely important. Now, do you think the government is doing enough, and I know you're on several councils about this, enough to attract the international talent? I think um, London, I think for a long period of time has been a magnet for international talent, um, partly because of the work opportunities, but also because of the quality of uh, the lifestyle living in London, the, the cultural opportunities that, that exist, um, the ability to explore the countryside, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, and, and none of those things have changed. So they, they continue to subsist. Um, and the question then I think becomes around um, for people like me, um, visa opportunities, the, the things that the government is supporting um, in that regard and it is something that the government is focused on. I don't claim to be an expert on the government's immigration policy but I was recently asked to join the Build Back Better Business Council which is a body that the government has set up uh, with people from a range of different industries and I'm representing the, the legal industry to look at the government's Build Back Better program following the pandemic um, and they've got three pillars to that, innovation, infrastructure, and skills. And across all of that, to get advice from the, the council, the business council, on what businesses are particularly focused on, how government and industry can partner together on in, you know, getting the country back on track, building a more sustainable future for, for the UK. Um, across all of those strands of discussion that I've participated in, the point around ensuring that businesses are able to attract international talent has come up. Yes, it's been raised in the context of tech because I think the UK is very focused as all of that program around innovation, the adoption of technology um, and a sustainable uh, future through the use of technology. Um, but they're also looking at it in other contexts as well. So the city of London being a significant um, part of the UK economy and driving um, economic opportunity across the whole country recognising that in the financial services industry and those who support the financial services industry like lawyers, it's important to ensure that uh, the UK continues to be able to bring in the best talent globally because that will be what continues to be of London and the UK more generally its competitive advantage. Yeah, no, absolutely right about that. Now, this is the first time ever in the workplace we have five generations working together. And each of them has different priorities and partly a different sense of what morality is. So for some of the younger generation, Generation Z, they might feel that working on a transaction to do with oil and gas is absolutely unacceptable. While those who are of an older generation would think, well, we need oil and gas and we're just transitioning, so why not? 
how are you dealing with those sort of potential conflicts and conflicts in the workplace? Um, fortunately, not conflicts so far, Karina, but um, healthy discussion and debate. I think it manifests itself in a range of different ways. I'll come back to responsible business in a minute, but it, it manifests itself in um, things like the return to the office. Um, different, um, so far for us, different generations within our organisation have had a very different view over the past 12 months about the, the amount of time that should be spent in the office. Now, it's a generalisation. It's absolutely not um, the rule across the whole across the whole firm, but you certainly can see that um, in some instances, some of our um, more senior colleagues quite like being in the workplace. There's an established routine that they have followed for a long period of time. They're used to the infrastructure um, and have been less receptive to hybrid working. That said, their peers, same age, same background, et cetera. Some people are absolutely loving it and probably not looking forward to returning to the office. But it, it, it is coming through in things like that. Um, in certain situations, it, there's a difference in terms of um, tech adoption, um, familiarity with tech concepts, um, uh, familiarity with um, the change in client demands around service delivery, all those types of things. So uh, there's those couple of elements. There's also just the style of communication within an organisation as well and needing to appeal to that broad church of, of colleagues. Um, some people who prefer communications from the management team to be in writing, some people who would prefer to listen to a podcast, others who would prefer to watch something um, like this. And so we need to be quite thoughtful. We need to be quite creative. And you've got to be prepared to have a constant um, feedback loop to make sure that what we're doing in each of those areas is working for, for everyone. Um, because going back to what we we're talking about before around inclusion, there is also, I think, a point around uh, generational diversity or making sure that we're creating a workplace that is appealing to all, all age groups. And so we have to be doing that um, in this arena as well. The, um, um, corporate social responsibility. Did you want me to address that? Because I, I don't want yes, you to think please. I was trying to dodge that. Um, that it's a it's a really interesting topic, and I think it's one that um, many organisations are working through um, at the moment. Um, so we uh, and I know that in in certain markets, so in the United States in particular, students are very focused on um, this, and um, in the legal press, you often see articles about students from some of the law schools lobbying law firms about uh, the client base that they have and where their revenue is coming from. So absolutely something that independently of that uh, we, were, we were looking at, but you, you obviously are conscious of the fact that we want to be attracting the best legal talent and, and want to be creating a uh, purpose-driven organisation that has strong values and that's appealing to everybody within the organisation, but including the younger generations to build the firm for the future. So we have a thriving um, uh, sustainability practice. We have a, a lively debate about um, the types of clients that uh, we um, want as our portfolio of clients and the types of mandates. And so that's an, an ongoing and evolving discussion. So every time an opportunity presents itself, we will have that discussion. So there are some obvious areas that are um, where it's easy to say no or yes, and then there's a gray zone. And I think that's the area that organizations are working through is that gray zone of which mandates and which clients do we take on and, and having, as I say, quite lively discussions around what kind of organization they want to be and who they wish to be associated with. Going back to your point about the working from home or working in the office, when you talk to the younger people, they seem to, and I know this is, again, a huge generalization, they want a hybrid of some sort. Um, but then you have people, I think it was, it was um, David Solomon of Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs Ball, who said that uh, working from home is an aberration. Young uh, have you ever thought that maybe the rise in profits in law firms over the pandemic Part of that, and one can't really speculate how big that part of, was because people were, they were at home with their dogs or they were at home with their family, depending on their circumstances. And actually, 
mental health, their chest was less, you know, they could go for a walk in a field if they happened to live outside London. So maybe, you know, how do you manage to deal with those, as you said, some of the senior partners who want to work from home, some who want to be in the office. How do you keep everybody happy, Georgia? <laughs> I think that's the 10 million pound question, Karina. If I work that out during my term as senior partner, I'll be very happy. I, I don't know that you can ever keep everybody happy all the time, but that said, um, I think we need to be prepared to be flexible. Uh, the whole idea behind flexible working is to have that flexibility. Um, and I, I do think that enhanced flexibility will be the way forward. It's just a question of how much um, and working through the consequences of the level of flexibility that an organization um, accepts. So um, the legal profession, like many other professions, is a master apprentice model. So people learn by observing um, and that, that uh, close proximity being down the corridor from somebody sharing an office with somebody is the way that we have developed the profession over a very long period of time. Now, technology means that you can still supervise, you can still have that apprenticeship type model through a screen. Um, but I think there are genuine questions about whether or not it's as effective in all aspects of being a legal professional as sitting together and working closely together. So there'll, there'll be a balance, I think, to be struck where people will need to work closely together for certain aspects of the job but there might be a degree of um, more flexibility or freedom, whatever you want to call it, for, for other aspects of the job. And uh, things like creating the collegiality uh, within an organisation and across borders that we pride ourselves on at Freshfields, and we think that that makes it not only a great place to work, but means we deliver better solutions for clients as well because we know each other well, we understand each other, we communicate quite effectively, making sure that that isn't eroded um, through hybrid working or remote working over an extended period of time. Over the past 15 months, organisations have been very successful at navigating the change because there's been a history of building relationships within the organisation that have held people together and they've meshed us together for a period of time. And I think in my mind, at least, there's a question about for how long can we rely on that um, to hold things together over the longer term? And what are we going to have to do to bring people together to create that glue and the culture in, in the organization. Um, and uh, I think the thrust of your question was, how do you keep, how do you keep people happy? I, I think within Freshfields, we're taking an approach of recognizing that this is new to the organization that we will be learning as we do it and um, going into it with, I guess, that innovative mindset that we don't have all the answers on day one, that we will have to work it out as we go along. We will potentially fail in some areas we then need to course correct and test something else so um, that is certainly what we'll be trying to do across the firm and just having a an ongoing conversation about what's working what isn't and what we can do to fix it you um you talked earlier about the the long term building a firm for the long term and that's what partners always do and i mean here you're going to see my unconscious bias but partnerships difficult you know, you are managing a set of prima donnas, if I may say so. But, but the reality is, it's what they might call, and they used to say about Goldman Sachs, long-term greedy. You're building a firm that you would like to see way past when you've left to continue and continue being innovative and fair. And yet there is always, there's always a... Well, the temptation of listing and Mishkondorea is set to become the most highly valued law firm on the London stock market because the partners have voted to, to float. 83-year-old law firm. What do you think of partnerships floating and would Freshfields consider this? Very interesting question. Be before I come to it, I do have to, for the record, say that I wouldn't call my partners prima donnas, Karina. <laughs> I would call them very intelligent, highly ambitious <laughs> Um, individuals, but um, yeah, who I very much enjoy working with. Um, on, on the question of listing, um, I, I don't think it is in our, certainly not in our near term um, horizon. I think um, our, the way we have developed the firm over time, um, the global footprint that we've developed, the sense of pride in the ownership that partners have of the firm, um, and the entrepreneurialism that comes from that is 
uh, part of our DNA and I think is probably you know, one of the ingredients of our success. And, and so I think we would probably be loath to interfere with, with that. Um, it would have been an interesting debate to sit and listen to, I think, at um, Mishkan and, and to hear what motivated the partners to make this change after, to, after all that time. And, and also I think probably in a few years time to, to hear their views on how they, how they feel it's going, what are the pain points, what's been better than they had expected, what's been more challenging. Um, but no, it's not, not in our future. How do you keep uh, a culture of innovation going? I mean, do you do it, if, if I think of this, this is obviously not a talk of services, but if you think of um, Nescafe ended up, or Nestle, sorry, Nestle, ended up having to sort of set up a different, a different body to come up with innovation that was almost separate from the main, the main headquarters, the main body. Now you've got a Silicon Valley practice you've, you've brought in, but innovation is everywhere. How do you, um, how do you breed innovation? It's a, it's a really good question. And I think um, we've probably got a lot to learn from our clients who are exceptional in this area. So we do um, talk to them about it and try to learn from, from their successes. I think many organizations have done what you described in Nestle's case, which is to set up a specialist unit um, designed to focus on this. Um, I think over time, maybe there's been a slight shift in the thinking about that because that then tends to suggest it's a specialist separate area that only some people can play a role in. Um, where I think the tech companies have maybe been slightly different about that is to encourage everybody to have a you could call it an innovative mindset or a continuous improvement mindset. And so that every single day, every employee is coming to work, thinking about how things could be different, how they could be better, what's a brilliant business idea, how can we disrupt the market? Um, and if you've got an organisation like us of 5,000 people thinking in that way, you'll probably make a lot more progress than if it, you've separated it out as a separate um, area. That said, we do have a specialist team of uh, lawyers and technologists who work together on creating innovative tech products um, to help with client service delivery. So it might be something like a, an enormous M&A transaction, very complex due diligence on the assets relating to, to that particular transaction and tools that we have developed to run that process more efficiently, store that information more effectively and make that information available to our clients live so that they can see what is being uncovered through the due diligence exercise. It could also be uh, for us, we've also developed, um, developed that one, but we've also developed uh, things to help us run mass claims. So where there might be a product liability issue or something like that and multiple claims being launched in multiple jurisdictions, tech tools to enable us as the lawyers, but also our clients to manage that enormous uh, scale project. So I think there are some areas where you will certainly need specialists focused on particular problems within the business and trying to use their unique skills to, to crack them. But I think uh, for us, we are trying to create that continuous improvement mindset across the whole business so that everything that we're doing, whether you are in our marketing department, our finance department, or a lawyer facing clients, that you're trying to look at how we can do things more effectively every day. I mentioned Silicon Valley and your operations there. What you've done in the US, where you are, for the non-lawyers on this call, incredibly successful, you've acted totally different uh, in terms of your strategy in the US. What you've done is bring in excellent teams from other law firms. You've you know, bought them in rather than merging or, or buying um, another a US law firm why sort of how has that worked for you and is this going to be the strategy going forward or might you consider a merger um so you're right silicon valley is a very exciting um development for us we opened almost 12 months ago 12 months ago next week and so we're doing some things in the next couple of weeks to celebrate the first year and have a birthday party <laughs> for, the, for the new team um and they come as you say from a range of different law firms um great practices, great credentials. Uh, it presents a different challenge to bring together people from a range of different backgrounds. You've got to, you've got to integrate people, you've got to create a common identity, a, a sense of team and, and common purpose. Um, and those that we've brought on board are um, 
unbelievably culturally aligned with the firm and so the integration has been very easy um, and they've got very clear objectives and, and they've been very successful so far in the, in the past 12 months. Um, that process of choosing individuals or a couple of members of a team and bringing them on board um, has worked really well for us. I suppose different organisations take different approaches, but for us, we've listened to our clients um, about what skills they're looking for from their lawyers, where are the gaps in our offering potentially, or where would they like to see us broaden our team? And then we're trying to meet those specific client needs rather than merging with a large law firm that might have a range of different practices or skill sets that our clients aren't necessarily looking for or where we already have the existing offering. So this way we can build and bolt on to what we already have in a way that responds to, to client need. And that is what we can intend to do going forward. Freshfields achieved its best ever rankings last year in Asia Pacific, um, and you were the uh, senior partner there, not least due to great China practice. But China is becoming a major issue because it is integrated in the world economy. We're all doing business with the Chinese all the time, but the geopolitical strains have become more and more difficult. And for many firms, they're being asked to choose between the West and China. And this is all, it makes it very, very awkward for corporates caught in the middle. Now, what are you going to be able to do about this? And how are you dealing with what is going to become an ever larger problem, probably, in your Asia practice? Um, so we, we are fortunate to have a strong Asia practice. We have um, seven offices across the region in Japan, uh, three in China, two in Vietnam and Singapore. Um, if I was to step back to your wider question around um, uh, geopolitics, we've, um, the firm has been around for many, many years. I think over that long history has had to navigate various different political and, and economic shifts. We haven't had the global footprint for all 278 years, um, but we've certainly had a global footprint for um, at least the last 30 to 40 years in, in a really meaningful way. And I think um, the breadth of practices that we have, I think the connections that people have with government and industry mean that as and when um, these shifts or changes arise, we're reasonably well placed to to maybe be, uh, have advance notice of, of certain things or to be able to respond and help our clients navigate the change. And so I would put the current tensions between the US and China into that broader context, which is that um, this is something that we're familiar with across the organisation. This is obviously an issue, not just in the region, but globally, if we're honest, given the, the breadth of investments from both countries and, and the trade ties, et cetera, across the, across the globe. So it's something that our Asia business, but our, our global business, as well as our clients, are, are having to navigate. So like our clients, it's something we, we watch closely. Um, we advise on sanctions issues that arise as a result of this. We uh, help clients on transactions where they might be looking to exit particular markets as a result of, of some of these developments. Um, we advise them on how to handle disputes that might arise as a result of some of the, the increasing tensions or broken contracts as a result of you know, some of that geopolitical pressure playing out in the commercial sphere. So I think we will continue, continue to do that um, and um, help, our, help our clients navigate that. And then, you know, for our own business, continue to watch and adapt um, over the years ahead uh, and in the same way that our clients are. It sounds like it's a great source of business, actually, conflict. Now, moving back to inclusion, my last question for you before we go to questions from the audience. Did you realise when you became senior partner of this Magic Circle Law that you were going to be a huge role model, that other people would come to you and say, your being there has inspired me? No, I didn't. And uh, I think that probably makes me very naive, <laughs> Karina, but... Um, when, when the senior partner election process came up, um, I was genuinely focused on what was important for us as a firm, looking at where we were last year and looking at how the world had changed and, and looking at 
what we were capable of achieving, what, what did I think we as a firm should be focused on and, and what, uh, where did I think we needed to, to go? And, and that was what the, the conversation focused on throughout the election. Um, absolutely no focus on my gender and the effect of my gender on a potentially successful outcome in, in the election. Um, I, having said all of that, that being a woman in the law at this particular point in time, given the metrics that we talked about at the beginning, um, you are conscious that you're um, in a unique role, I suppose, or that there are maybe people looking to you as a role model um, because there aren't as many women uh, partners as uh, there should ideally be. So one of the things that I regularly say is I long for the moment where we have more women in leadership roles, more women in, in, part, in the partnership and, and in leadership roles, because I think that then allows colleagues across the organisation to see a path for them. The way that I have managed my career, my personality type, my background is not necessarily going to be a role model for everybody. It's not going to allow everybody to look at me and think I could be like that or I want to be like that even. <laughs> so the, the more people in the leadership roles, uh, the more chances there are that our colleagues could identify someone and say, actually, I can see you know, the way that Karina has done it, that's going to work for me or the way that somebody else has done it is going to work for me. And that then encourages more people into um, senior roles and, and to seek more leadership positions. So um, yes, I am conscious uh, and was conscious before becoming senior partner that as a female partner within our firm, there's a role model aspect to it. It's now significantly magnified in this, um, in this current role. Thank you. I mean, I look forward to the day when we don't have to be models because there's yes. so many of us there. I agree. I agree. That would now be let nice. Now let me just do, let's see. What, um, this is one of the questions, what are the changes that have been enabled by the pandemic, if any, that will make it easier for inclusion in law? Um, do you think they can't change forever to accommodate a virtual setting? Yeah, so I do, I do think the adoption of technology and people recognising that working remotely doesn't mean you're being inefficient or slacking off or something along those lines is incredibly helpful. I think um, at particular periods in people's lives, um, people might have caring responsibilities for ageing parents, they might have young children, they might themselves be unwell. The idea that you can still play a meaningful role in the workplace, you can be present through a computer screen um, and, and still create a network within the organisation while you're also navigating those other aspects of life is, I think, uh, going to be incredibly helpful for keeping people in the profession. Um, so I'm optimistic that it will help. There will be downsides that we'll have to navigate and, and deal with, but overall, I think that will help. On a related note, as a global organisation and sitting here in Asia, for many years in the evenings, uh, like now, I would have to dial in to telephone conferences to participate in a management meeting or a discussion about what we were going to do as a global practice group or, or whatever it might be. Dialing in on the telephone when 75% of the other people are sitting together in a room is quite difficult to, to influence. It's difficult to play a meaningful role. It's difficult to be visible. Teams, Zoom, all the other platforms that we're using completely change that and they level the playing field. You can have a colleague in the Middle East, a colleague in Russia, a colleague in the US, all on the screen together, able to have a conversation as, uh, as equals. And you can then bring the right people around the table for any given topic in a way that I just don't think was a, as effective in the past. So I think there are some, some good things in terms of supporting inclusion. Um, a question here about uh, cyber security. Does cybersecurity risk keep you awake at night? Uh, no, it doesn't keep me awake at night, um, but it is, it's a genuine risk for all businesses. So one of my largest cases over the last couple of years before taking on the senior partner role was a significant global data breach for a large um, global client of ours. And it is um, having helped clients through those types of moments, and I've done a few of them now, it's um, incredibly stressful um, experience for any business and very difficult for managing stakeholders um, if you're a listed company very can be damaged your, your share price and all those types of uh, concerns client relate customer relationships etc um, 
but definitely something that's, again, high up on the, the management agenda. Um, like all law firms, given the nature of the information that we hold on behalf of our clients, this is something where we have a significant budget to invest in our critical infrastructure and defence, effectively, of the data that we hold. Um, and I think it was just last week we got some special heightened uh, badging for the, the quality of the cyber um, security controls that we have. So I think everybody's constantly looking at this and trying to improve the standards and you know, recent events in the US would suggest that you can't take your eye off the ball, you have to continue to focus on investing in your cyber infrastructure. Actually, may I ask a follow-up question to that, which is what does keep you awake at night? <laughs> um, late night work calls, I think more than anything at the moment. Um, I think at the moment, the key thing that is troubling me, Karina, is um, it's been 15 long, hard months and people have felt isolated. People have lost family members. People have themselves been sick. Uh, people are worrying about um, themselves, their families, their careers. And uh, I want to make sure that we're doing what we can and what I'm doing what I can to create an environment where people have the support that they need. So mental health support, um, flexibility around how they deliver their work to accommodate those competing demands, the opportunity to take a break. So we did just announce recently some fresh fields days where we've given colleagues over the summer two additional days for the whole firm to be closed um, on a Friday in most markets on a Sunday in the Middle East so that people get a long weekend. Um, and they're typically attached to a bank holiday weekend. So people are ideally getting a four day weekend. And we've also announced some community days so that our teams can come back together and be giving back to our communities, recognizing that we are very fortunate um, throughout this past 15 months and using our either our legal skills or our time in ways to give back to our community. So making sure that we're doing what we can to recognise the challenges that our um, colleagues are all going through and to be creating a, a supportive environment um, so that everybody can get through the next couple of months, hopefully everybody get vaccinated and, um, and things to, to start to return to some semblance of normality, whatever that might end up looking like, but without the stresses and strains of the past 15 months. Now, um, somebody, and I think it must be a, a younger lawyer, has sent me uh, a question for you, which is you talk about the master apprenticeship model, but surely with AI, some of those uh, younger lawyers, we will be done out of a job or done out of, I suppose it means it he or she means done out of the learning that one gets in all that boring work that you had to do in your first few years. And it um, was boring, Georgia. Don't tell me it wasn't. No, I will absolutely say it was boring. So this is the positive response to anybody who's concerned there won't be career opportunities. Um, so a couple of things. You're absolutely right. There will be some aspects of what has historically been junior lawyer work that will not be done by junior lawyers anymore. Um, I personally applaud that and I'm quite excited about it and actually we were talking about it in a management meeting earlier today and what does that mean for us in terms of how do we how do we train people what do our team structures look like etc um, the good news I think is that if I look back on some of those things that I did have to do in those first couple of years of being a junior lawyer they include and I've mentioned this in in another talk um, I, as a litigation lawyer, working on a large discovery exercise. So for those who haven't done that yet, that is when you go to court, the parties are obliged to disclose documentation that might be relevant to the case. Um, and you have to obviously index all of that information and then share it with the other side. They review it and they work out which evidence they want to rely on in the case. So in the discovery process to index the, the evidence, uh, back in the day when I was younger, you had to go through manually in hard copy documents and this was quite modern at the time, stick a barcode on the bottom right-hand corner of every page, scan the page, and then fill in in handwriting what the contents of the document was. Somebody else then typed that up and then you created this database of evidence. So that was frighteningly modern <laughs> back in the 1990s. Um, I don't know that I learned anything other than project management skills or team skills, which are highly valuable. I'm not going to suggest that they're, they're, they're not. They are what uh, I love about the job and what makes us successful. But I think you can learn those skills in a different context 
while also deploying your, your legal skills. So I think that junior lawyers will start to do more interesting work. Um, uh, law and what businesses are seeking to do hasn't become any easier. It's become increasingly complex. Um, regulation is complex. Things like Brexit means you're having to deal with layers of law and regulation. Um, the move towards nationalism rather than globalization, assuming that trend continues, will mean that the things are more complicated potentially over time. So there will be interesting, thorny, knotty problems for junior lawyers to, to work on and to deploy their legal skills on. While some of those things that I was doing, which are all now done by machines, um, can be done elsewhere. Brexit, um, we're being asked about Brexit. Has it brought more work to the firm or less? On balance, would you say it's a positive or a negative? Um, I don't know that I can answer Without this. being political. Being political. <laughs> I don't think I can answer the second part of that uh, question. Um, the first part I can answer, um, and I can't, I can't answer the second part because I think it's probably uh, too early to tell and it depends uh, on your business, what your footprint was before Brexit, what your footprint is after Brexit. I think there's so many variables where it's, it's a good outcome for some businesses, some, uh, some industries and, and, and maybe not so good for others. Um, on the first point, has it produced more work? Certainly um, clients required quite a lot of advice on what it meant for them and, and how they needed to navigate it. What did they need to do with their corporate structures? Um, through to their um, maybe their intellectual property rights or a whole range of different topics. So um, it did certainly provide advice on, on that. For us as an organisation, because we have such a large pan-European presence, large London office, but also multiple offices across Europe as well, we are perfectly hedged, I suppose, for, um, for the various different outcomes, depending on where the government ultimately landed in the Brexit negotiations. So for us, it hasn't... Um, it hasn't had a, a negative impact on, on the business. We've been able to help guide clients through that. And we ourselves were able to manage our own structures to deal with the Brexit changes and to do that relatively smoothly. Um, and then there's a question here about ageism, uh, that law firms have always had this model where the partners retire at a certain point and go off and do something else. But, and that leaves space for the new ones to come up. But surely now when, you know, it can be, um, it's illegal to really to make people retire at a certain age. How are you going to deal with that going forward? Um, I don't think we've ever had a standardized approach across the firm. So we've uh, always had and still have today partners who are uh, with the firm for, um, many, many years and, and uh, inclu you know, including into late 60s. Um, uh, others who choose to either retire completely or to move on to something different in, in their 50s, between 55 and, and 60. So it's always been um, a different, I think, in, in different markets and, and individual partners have chosen different paths depending on their personal circumstances and their interests. So, um, uh, I don't think any of that will change. I think we, you know, some of our partners are incredibly talented, incredibly experienced, and our clients want them around forever. They don't ever want them to retire, <laughs> and, and we're very happy to, to keep them in the business. Um, there are other people who are really passionate about moving on to doing something um, uh, around charitable work or to pursue another interest and, and equally supportive of them staying in contact with the firm and providing opportunities for us through those new networks that they have, but, um, but moving on to something else. So I don't know that we will fundamentally change um, other than that I am quite focused on uh, keeping in better contact with our retired partners. They're an incredibly valuable network. Um, and so we're making some efforts to, to uh, reach out to them more regularly than we maybe have in the past. Because I know McKinsey has a great network, you know, um, and they've certainly leveraged that beautifully in fresh fields. I mean, you've got people doing all sorts of interesting things. Absolutely. Now, this is a question that somebody sent in. I don't know how you're going to answer this, which is when are we going to see the first gay senior partner of a magic circle law firm? 
Depending on how you define uh, the magic circle um, and depending on whether you're prepared to be flexible around that title and something equivalent to that title, I, th I believe we already have one, <laughs> is, <laughs> uh, is the short answer to that. <clears throat> but, okay, so what is, perhaps um, this person wasn't aware of that, but what is the longer answer to just it being almost... Almost, I was about to say, almost as normal as having two women who are leading magic circle law firms. I, uh, I'm reasonably optimistic. <clears throat> excuse me about that. Um, I think um, uh, there is a there's a really strong uh, um, within the legal industry, a really strong LGBT plus uh, network, really strong ally network. There are high levels of representation of the LGBT community within um, law firms. And I, I believe it's like the banking industry increasingly seen as a, um, I don't know if you could call it a preferred profession, but certainly a very inclusive profession where people can belong and, and thrive. So I, I think um, we, absolutely, we absolutely will see that. I think the focus hopefully in, in discussions is around talent, leadership qualities, the ability to communicate with, with people and, and, uh, and that will be driving leadership decisions. Thank you very much, Georgia. I fear we have uh, no more time. A huge thank you to you for giving us this, this interview by a number of people in your own firm, but um, whether you want to be a role model or not, you're an amazing role model. And hear from us all at the Inclusion Initiative and Open Door, Open City. Thank you so much for being with us today. Absolute pleasure, Karina. Thank you. Thank you for the nice um, conversation. And I'm sorry if we had some tech challenges today, but hopefully the audience was able to capture most of it. <laughs>